the question is, why has the left been successful? Why is the right always retreating? And I think in order to understand this, one has to sort of do first things first and understand what we mean by right and what we understand by left. And I know I'm probably going to offend many people with my definition of the right, which I've done repeatedly at these conferences in the past, but I shall do it again. Uh, what puts you on the right is you oppose the belief in human equality, the doctrine of human equality, that you believe that human beings are by nature unequal, uh, and if you are a traditional conservative, you defend hierarchy as, as better than its alternatives. And in any case, you oppose any state attempt to level down differences, social differences, gender differences. Um, uh, a, a second criterion, I would suppose, is a preference, more than just a preference, a strong commitment to traditional social morality. Um, whether or not you want to use the instrument of the state to enforce it, and I do not, because, uh, basically because I think the state is pernicious and will always work in the opposite direction, and therefore I am uh, strategically a radical libertarian. Um, uh, but it is not because for a moment I think that uh, you know, people should have right to any sort of lifestyle, they have a human right. Um, I think that sort of given what is the political configuration or situation at the present time, what it is likely to be in the future, um, I would like to remove the state as much as possible from private or from public life. But, but a traditional conservative believes that those moral principles upon which society have rested, certainly in the Western world, um, and we might was very often referred to contemptuously as bourgeois morality, should be defended, that they are necessary for the social good, uh, and they're necessary even for the individual develop, de development. Uh, the left, on the other hand, is opposed to this, and I suppose a, you know, a person who believes in some sort of Catholic natural law doctrine would say they are opposed to nature itself, um, but they believe that nature is malleable and society as it existed until now is based on social, cultural injustice and the modern therapeutic welfare state that I write about in my books is the ideal, certainly the convenient, expediential instrument to change everything um, and to uh, create a more egalitarian world in which national boundaries, other things that have divided us in the past, gender differences, religion, all of these things will be removed. Um, and human beings for the first time will become sensitive um, and just. Um, the more radical, I suppose, the more radical multiculturalists would argue that these things already exist in non-Western societies. Um, they just the West is behind. Um, and what this, of course, requires that we do is radically uh, reconstruct every other non-Western society to make it look more progressive in terms of this model, this future model, um, that we would like to introduce into the Western world. Uh, the right, in any case, opposes what is called the leftist project, which I've tried to describe. Uh, but the leftist project has done extremely well, um, and it seems, in my, as far as I can see, to be unstoppable. Uh, it may stop at some future point, however, when the Western world is going to be repopulated by non-Westerners who have absolutely no commitment to any of these leftist propositions. At that point, um, all bets will be off. And uh, if one were to ask me what is to happen, I would say this is the likely consequence um, of the left going on and on. And another point that I would make is we're not talking about the Marxist-Leninist left. Um, uh, what the Cold War did was uh, bring about the, the end of a garrison state reactionary geriatric form of socialism. That is not what the left is. Uh, the left exists in the United States. In fact, the United States previews this model. Um, it is multicultural, it is bureaucratic, it uses public administration um, to make us like each other um, and to create a world in which we constantly fight against discrimination hate speech, hate thought, um, and in which we use all public institutions, particularly public education, to carry this on. Um, a, a, another thing which has been absolutely ind indispensable is the growth of, for the left's triumph, is the growth of public administration. Now everything else, I would argue, is ancillary 
um, or derivative from public administration. I, I will have to say I'm a political determinist. Culture is shaped by public administration. It pays for culture. It educates people. Um, it passes anti-discrimination laws. Um, uh, you cannot separate culture from the modern democratic, in quotation, welfare state. It's almost impossible to. Um, the, uh, you talk about society. Society is being constantly reshaped by the state. Uh, we are not talking about a medieval state. We're not talking about the American government of 1820, federal government. We're talking about a state that reaches into the lives of all of its people. Um, one that you can never vote out of office because both political parties are extensions of the state. They are the authorized national parties. Um, after the Second World War, when the Americans re-educated the Germans, where they did the same, they, 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 in order to have democracy, Germans must be instructed in democracy. There are to be X numbers of parties which correspond to the American political parties, and there's to be a large public administration which will re-educate the Germans. Um, now, this is the a model that established itself in the United States, which they then, Americans feel free then to, um, to export to countries uh, which they've defeated in war and which they're going to re-educate. Um, so, as I said, the Americans really preview this public administration committed through social engineering um, to the creation of a pluralistic society. The word pluralism is used and then it will be replaced eventually uh, in the last 20 years by multiculturalism. Uh, now, you asked me, you know, am I against all pluralism? I am not against natural pluralism. Um, uh, you heard me yesterday speak fondly of the Habsburg Empire and the Ottoman Empire because they had various groups and they were able to sort of live together. Um, what, the, what the American project, the American experiment is about is bringing as many people in as you can and then socializing them through the state. Um, it, it involves a social experiment. It is not simply the acceptance of what already exists. Uh, in the case of the Habsburg Empire, they were dealing with a medieval uh, with a medieval political and social structure. I mean, these are the things that uh, uh, a particular territorial um, prince or ruler faces. It is not an attempt to undertake an experiment um, in social interaction, which I think American pluralism does become at a certain point in time. Um, an, an, an event which I think is sometimes misunderstood and yet which I think helps the left take power in many ways is the Cold War. Um, it, it, is, it was very popular, especially in my youth, to describe the, the uh, anti-communism as an ideology of the right or of the far right. And through most of my life, even my early academic life, the people on the left were typically pro-communist or anti-anti-communist. The people on the right were in favor of prosecuting the Cold War uh, and were against the Soviet Union. That was the defining issue. Okay. Now, later the civil rights uh, issue, but I would say even the civil rights issue is a secondary issue. Uh, if you remember, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed predominantly with Republican votes. Um, and uh, uh, the Republican Party supported civil rights. I mean, they've, they've been badly repaid by the black voters. Uh, but in fact, the Republicans were generally behind all the civil rights, things, even when the Democrats were the party of segregation in the United States. Um, but, but the civil, civil rights issues were not as important um, as what one American conservative, uh, James Burnham, speaks of as the protracted conflict, uh, which is a struggle against Soviet communism. Um, just about every issue of National Review, the conservative, the then conservative, or traditional conservative magazine, which it no longer is, um, was about communism and anti-communism. Uh, this was the overriding issue. Um, it was not um, uh, the issue of whether the government should pass laws uh, again, uh, dealing with discrimination against women, whether there should be affirmative action for gays or whatever you know, de defines our politics now. It was simply a foreign policy issue. And I met some people who were profoundly conservative on many domestic issues, 
but whom I considered to be pinkos or reds or radicals because they were soft on the Soviets. Um, through most of my life, I considered George Kennan, who was probably one of the most conservative figures um, in American intellectual life, to have been a leftist uh, because he was soft on the Soviets. Um, if one reads him, he was equally soft on Kaiser Wilhelm and equally soft on a whole bunch of other you know, things, but uh, he was soft on the Soviets. Therefore, in my mind, uh, he was a leftist. Uh, this was the issue. Now, uh, what happens, of course, uh, is that the anti-communist side will gradually be taken over by the left, um, or at least by the anti-communist left. Um, and it becomes an extension of what in America's liberal internationalism, uh, which goes back to Woodrow Wilson in the First World War. Uh, it is based on the view that the United States um, is to bring democracy to other countries, uh, that American foreign policy is to serve missionary ends, democratic missionary ends. Um, and it sounds very much like Bolshevism or French Jacobinism. Um, but uh, this is not to be done in the name of the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution, but in the name of American values. Um, and by, by the 1960s, certainly by the 1970s, um, the dominant form of anti-communism becomes liberal internationalism. I would say something that I did not even know or suspect at the time, um, because in my mind I still identified anti-communism with the right and McCarthyism in the United States. Um, and Pope Pius XII who got up and declaimed against the communists. Um, but anti-communism um, slowly, and I, th I think in a, in a way that was unknown to many Europeans, became in the United States and the ideology or the, the carrier of liberal internationalism. Um, and uh, the, the civil rights acts and civil rights laws were justified as being necessary to win the war against the Soviets. Uh, this was an argument made uh, by Lyndon Johnson, by Hubert Humphrey, uh, by the American uh, uh, so-called conservative writer Harry Jaffa, um, it was an argument I found, you know, finally popping up in National Review in the 1970s, uh, that we have to accept all these things because they are necessary to carry on the struggle against the Soviets. Now, in Europe, I think that you have the same kind of, um, of ideological division. Uh, and I remember reading the work of some right-wing Italian publicist, Marco Tarchi, in which he talks about how he became a right-winger and in fact, he is what joins the, um, the Movimento Sociale d'Italia, which is sort of the kind of neo-fascist group, because he went and saw a John Wayne movie, The Green Beret. And he was so moved by the struggle against the communists in Vietnam that he joined the Italian right. Um, and it almost made sense to me, but then I was thinking, you know, really would, uh, even if you like The Green Beret movie, why would you join? The Italian right has nothing to do with, the, uh, with this, and in fact, if you look at Europe, uh, uh, many of these, uh, of these extreme right-wing parties were anti-American throughout the Cold War, uh, something which came as a surprise to me, which I discovered about 10 years ago, after the Cold War was over. Um, but it does turn out that you know, the Movimento Sociale d'Italia was strongly anti-communist, strongly supported the Americans in Vietnam, so, so that um, uh, the, the, there was also a widespread perception in Europe that anti-communism was the issue that defined the right, right? Um, meanwhile, I think in the United States, anti-communism becomes identified more and more with the anti-communist left, or the left center, not the far left, but certainly the left center. Um, and you have the labor movements, uh, Humphrey, Scoop Jackson, Democrats, finally the neoconservatives who end up taking over the conservative movement, um, who are really part of the liberal internationalist, pro-labor union, Zionist, uh, uh, moderate left, um, but they were certainly anti-communist, or they were anti-Soviet. Um, and uh, but I but I think it is inevitable that this happens because all of the momentum, the cultural political momentum in these countries and in the United States, is on the left. Um, so much so that by the time you get what is I think improperly or incorrectly viewed as a conservative revolution, with the election of Ronald Reagan, is no revolution of any kind and is simply a brief interruption in the continued movement leftward of the American government and American society. Uh, there is no conservative revolution of any kind that occurs in the United States. Um, and, uh, but the liberal media, of course, are happy to run with this 
and so are conservative think tanks because people are going to give you money because, see, you carried out a conservative revolution. Um, and, but you can't say, no, we failed. No one's going to give you any money if you failed. Uh, we didn't even try. They'll give you even less money. This, this, is, this is actually what happened. Um, so you say we actually carried a revolution. You just didn't notice it, but there's a revolution. And the, the official liberal neoconservative view in the United States is now that there was a great conservative revolution in the 1980s, um, and it, is, it, con it continues with the election of George H.W. Bush. You get four more years of the counter-revolution. Um, and then uh, it is resumed with George, um, George W. Bush, who is really a counter-revolution. I remember picking up a French newspaper, it could have been Le Monde, uh, or Le Monde et de in the United States, and they're explaining to me that uh, the thinker who most influenced George W. Bush was the Catholic counter-revolutionary uh, Joseph de Mest. And I was like looking at this saying that these people are insane. You know, I mean, George W. Bush, uh, you know, is uh, a, a kind of fraternity member who drank too much, uh, who politically always sounds something like a leftist. He's talking about global democracy, women's rights. Um, even as Christianity is usually, uh, you know, comes down to we have to give everybody democracy and human rights. Um, how is he Joseph de Mest? But but for the French, uh, secularism is such a dominant, militant ideology that any, uh, any American who says, I'm a reborn Christian, is automatically identified with the counter-revolution in France. Um, so so the, uh, the European press will play along very happily. Uh, the liberal press will play along because the, the right has proclaimed what is really inaction and nothing um, in terms of a counter-revolution to be a counter-revolution. Uh, and uh, one might say the left is able to continue winning um, all the cultural political wars, but claiming that it's either a stalemate or they're losing because a counter-revolution is taking place. Um, the, uh, the most interesting thing about this, uh, I give me back to, is that American militarism is what I describe as left-wing militarism. Um, it is not the militarism of the fascist movement. Uh, it is not the militarism of the Catholic counter-revolution in Spain. Um, it is nothing but pure Jacobinism. Um, it, is, uh, it is wars carried out to spread human rights, now with women's rights, etc. Et Why these things should be considered um, uh, part of the right is, uh, is unclear, unless one looks at American party politics. And there you discover that the uh, the campaigns to spread democracy are only attacked, you know, as right-wing fascistic enterprises when Republicans undertake them. Um, when Bush does it, it is fascistic, it is evil, it is the Catholic counter-revolution or whatever. When President Obama comes into office, carries in the same war, we all have to get behind him and help. Uh, which, you know, has been pretty much the view that I've, I've been encountering in the American liberal press. Uh, there's one black journalist, Herbert Matthew, I think is his name, uh, who writes for the New York Times, who said that um, it's a really a shame how people are not volunteering for the military. This is after, after Obama came in. Before that, he was screaming against these. Yes, he said, not that I'm defending these wars, but now that we're in these wars, we should not embarrass President Obama. So all of this is a function of party politics. Uh, the left is not inherently uh, pacifistic now any more than it was in the past. You know, um, I, I, I remember once hearing um, George McGovern, who deplored the bloodshed of the Vietnam War, say, you know, he bombed uh, uh, Salzburg or other cities in Austria during the Second World War, and he's proud of his record. Well, he murdered civilian population, but that was okay because he was fighting fascism. When you fight communism, it's a different matter. You're not so, you know, then you are supposed to you know, weep uh, over every uh, the life of every communist guerrilla that gets lost, or that's lost. Um, so so I, th I think a lot, a lot of what is seen as um, the anti-militarism of the left is purely for show. Uh, and it depends whether their guy is in power, whether their guy is out. 